Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is Katie Cook from AHI. I am the Telehealth Project Manager here for those who might be new to the call. Um, thank you for joining today. I know it's beautiful outside and we'd rather be outside, so I'll try to make this call quick today. Um, welcome to the Telehealth Learning Collaborative uh, put on by the North Country Telehealth Partnership. Um, we haven't met since March, so we do have a few updates from our friends at the state level. Um, we always like to get this call started with some updates from the Department of Health, the Office of Mental Health, and the Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services um, as it relates to the regulatory and reimbursement environment. And um, usually they don't always have an update, but it's a good time to ask questions as well. So before we get started, um, if you have a question, please uh, put it into the question window. Should be a couple of notches down and you can put a question right in there. That is not where you would want to put your audio pin. Um, you would want to type your audio pin directly into your phone. Or if you're having trouble with that, just raise your hand and I'll be able to see um, who has a question. So uh, I've opened up our Department of Health reps phone line, Megan Program. So Megan's going to give us a quick update on what's going on at the state level as it relates to Medicaid fee-for-service. And I have a couple of questions that I've been compiling over the last month for her. So Megan, I've opened your line if you're available. Yes, thank you, Katie. Oh. This is Megan Procorum from the New York State Department of Health. So our last collaborative call in March, um, I talked about some of the proposals that were relating to uh, an, um, changing the public health law, which guides Medicaid reimbursement policy under telehealth parity law. So since then, the um, the uh, the, uh, the annual budget uh, has included amendments to uh, the public health law to expand the eligible list of telehealth providers, as well as the definitions of originating site where a patient needs to be located, as well as remote patient monitors. So I'll begin with the changes to the um, list of eligible uh, telehealth providers. Those are at the distant hub site. They now um, include, uh, to more explicitly uh, include uh, residential health care facilities that serve special needs populations. Hospitals and nursing homes, uh, which are defined as residential health care facilities, were already um, eligible providers, but this uh, explicitly spells, spells out that special pop needs populations providers are included in the definition. And then um, based on uh, feedback from our regulatory modernization initiative, credentialed alcoholism and substance abuse counselors credentialed by the Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services or another credentialing entity uh, are also added. And then um, providers authorized to provide services for the early intervention program, this is a DOH program, as well as EI service coordinators have also been added. Additional providers include clinics licensed or certified under Article 16 of the Mental Hygiene Law. This includes certified and non-certified day and residential programs funded or operated by the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities. And then lastly, there's a clause in there which uh, includes that other providers determined by the commissioner pursuant to regulation or in consultation with the commissioner of health and the commissioners of mental health, office of alcoholism and substance abuse services, and then commissioner of office for people with developmental disabilities pursuant to regulation. So this means that other Provi telehealth providers may be eligible for Medicaid fee-for-service reimbursement under public health law at the discretion of each of the um, uh, commissioner uh, via regula re regulation. I'll move on now to the expansion of the definition of, of the originating site. This is where the patient needs to be located at the time of the healthcare services are delivered for Medicaid fee-for-service reimbursement. 
So this is uh, also, the amendments also were uh, changed to make explicit that certified and non-certified day and residential programs funded or operated by office for people with developmental disabilities are included. And then also I think most of interest to everyone um, is that now the patient's place of residence located within the state of New York or any other temporary location located within or outside of the state of New York uh, is now included. So I think this is a really important change um, for everyone to know about. And then the definition of remote patient monitoring was also changed to include technologies uh, that also include additional interaction triggered by previous transmissions, such as interactive queries conducted through communication technologies or by telephone. So this expansion means that um, it just allows for once a provider has received some kind of data from um, a patient wherever they may uh, be located, um, if that communication received by the provider warrants a follow-up phone call, that would be included as part of the reimbursement. And then lastly of note, um, as, as, as part of this amendment, uh, there's um, a section in there that states that the Department of Health, the Office of Mental Health, and Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services and the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities will coordinate the issuance of a single guidance document, document that will update appropriately that will uh, seek to identify differences and regulations or policies by our different agencies uh, with special focus on uh, reimbursement as well as to help uh, assist consumers, providers, and plans in understanding and facilitating use of telehealth. So we, as um, as uh, as these agencies, we uh, we meet every other week, and we're actively working on this guidance document currently. And then maybe to anticipate some questions, given all of these changes that are, you know, substantial in nature, our Office of Health Insurance Programs is currently working on a Medicaid update to really um, provide some of the guidance, but also spell out um, how to reimburse for telehealth uh, under Medicaid fee-for-service, and that is due out um, this July. Excellent. I know that um, a lot of us are looking forward to that new Medicaid update. Um, will the Medicaid update include guidance on billing for telemedicine in the school setting, given that schools are now included as an eligible site? I believe so. They are really going um, service by service, so it should be fairly comprehensive. Okay, good to know. And for anybody who needs clarity on the line, there are not slides attached to this portion of the learning collaborative. This is more of a discussion and an update from the folks at the state, um, giving you all a chance to hear what Megan has to say, as sometimes, you know, we, we can't always get that, that clarity that she provides, which is nice. And rest assured that I will be um, summarizing what Megan's talking about, and I'll work alongside her to make sure that I have the right message um, sent across to all of you in the meeting notes that will go out later this week. Um, I, Megan, I don't see any other updates at this time, but I did have a few questions for you that have come up in meetings in the past month, month and a half. So the first question was, um, obviously PT and OT are allowable providers under Medicaid fee-for-service. Um, are you aware of any PT, OT, or even speech pathology telehealth applications in New York State, um, specifically in preschools or elementary schools? That's a great question. I yeah, right. So just to confirm, they are on um, in the, included in the def, the original definition for under telehealth parity law for public health law. Um, I don't know of any specific um, applications for those services in those settings, unfortunately. Okay, and I, I haven't yet found any myself, but I have some interest in the northern counties that I work with mm -hmm. in developing some of those programs, so I was looking to see if anyone on the line or if you knew of any of those types of programs. Um, the next question is, are there posted fee-for-service billing rates 
And are there any rural versus urban area restrictions? The, um, in general, no, there are no rural versus urban restrictions, unlike for Medicaid fee for service. Um, as you know, you know, Katie, and I'm sure you help those on the line. There are restrictions for Medicare reimbursement in terms of um, uh, where the patient has to be located. They have to be in a, in a rural, uh, uh, medically underserved. Um, area but area. Medicaid does Correct. not have that same restriction there's not a rural urban restriction at all there's no um, uh, restriction in terms of any uh, you know and now um, they would just have to you know the both the patient and the provider would need to be enrolled in the Medicaid program and I'm sorry can you uh, ask the first part of that question again sure are there posted fee-for-service billing rates um, not to my knowledge, um, Medicaid pays what it pays. So I, I believe it's the, for telehealth, it, it, it is likely the, the same as if it were not conducted via telehealth. Um, the Medicaid update will speak to what, if there is that originating site fee, what that fee will be once um, they have that published in July, hopefully. Okay. And the last question I'm seeing is, um, do you know when the OASAS, OMH, OPWDD, DOH guidance document is expected to come out? Yes, we are working with the tentative date of um, by December to have that uh, fully approved and published. Right now, um, the Office of People with Developmental Disabilities is still finalizing their um, clinical guidelines for telehealth and have been meeting with their uh, provider associations, um, just finishing that up this past week. So what's happening with that is that they're going to take some of that feedback and then uh, finalize the draft and then send it on for um, approval. So that's uh, they're, you know, probably in the, the last uh, stage of, of that in terms of where they're at in terms of being to write regulations to add to um, our interagency document. Okay, excellent. Um, I'm not, oh, I have one more question that just came through. So how do all of these changes affect the federally qualified health centers receiving reimbursement under threshold methodology? That is an excellent question. And um, we have been dealing piecemeal with individual questions about that. A lot of it has to do with um, whether or not the, the service that's being rendered um, via telehealth is under their normal uh, approved scope of service. Um, in general, though, um, the FQHC will be given their threshold rate, at, um, even if the patient is not in a clinic and they're being provided the service via telehealth. So that is one thing we work with our Office of Health Insurance Programs to ensure that an FQHC can um, can be reimbursed as a distant site because some other states and under Medicare, FQHCs cannot be a distant site and get reimbursed for it, but that will not be the case here in New York. We um, work very closely with them to ensure that to happen. And then it gets a little more um, uh, nuance when we talk about uh, if the service of being provided via telehealth would be um, under their normal scope of service. So, for instance, for an oral surgeon, if that was the distant site provider, that's normally not covered under an FQHC's um, right scope of service. Therefore, uh, the um, the distant site should bill Medicaid directly unless the FQHC was also providing a, a, an additional um, health service um, to that patient at, during that one encounter. So that's a brief summation. We hope to work with um, the FQHCs and, and chicanies more closely on what the new uh, 
statutory amendment mean for them? And um, we've been working really closely with Finger Lakes uh, to to really address some of their specific questions that I think will help um, inform um, it for everyone. So it would be great to maybe schedule some um, webinars specifically for the FQHCs to really dive into um, some of the issues and uh, questions and concerns. Okay, and I, I let the person who asked that know if she has additional questions to reach out to me and I can connect you to her. Okay, sounds good. Um, one more question did pop up about credentialing by proxy. Um, it is only currently permitted by hospitals. Um, do you know if there's any thoughts in regards to amending legislation to allow credentialing by proxy from hospitals to distant site elements and entities at the state level? I personally do not know of any movement on that front, no. Okay, and that kind of falls into another question I had about anything on the Department of Health stance on duly licensed providers that work, say, near Vermont or Pennsylvania, if there's any anticipated, you know, relaxed requirements for those providers. I've had those questions come up, but I think that falls more under the licensure compact. Right, and, and just to and write the compact, but also um, just thinking about uh, making sure that providers are credentialed with each health plan that they may be working with with the patient population. And so if they're working with New York State Medicaid patients, they should be enrolled as providers for New York State Medicaid. Okay. Um, I don't have any other questions. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, again, everyone, I will be summarizing these notes and uh, sending them out, you know, later this week. Okay, um, no, I don't know why there's an echo. It's okay that there is an echo, guys. If um, everybody who's online could just make sure that your line is muted, that will eliminate the echo, um, both organizers and presenters. I hope that helps. Perfect. All right, um, so Amy Smith from the Office of Mental Health did not have an update for us. Um, but one thing I wanted to clarify with everyone, I've been asked some questions about licensed mental health counselors under OMH. They are not yet allowed to bill for telepsychiatry under OMH regulations, but OMH is hoping to expand their regulations to include um, some additional eligible providers, which will include social workers and licensed mental health counselors and psychologists by the end of the year. Um, and then last but not least, um, OASAS. Um, I know that there's not too many updates from OASAS, but I do see that Sarah Osborne is on the line. So, Sarah, whenever you're ready, I sent you a pin. If you have any updates for us, we'd be happy to hear from you. I'm just waiting to see if she's going to hop on the line. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any activity from her, but um, from the OASAS front, I know that they are working on a new standards document as it relates to technology requirements. And um, that will, new version should be ready in a few weeks. Additionally, um, Megan talked about certified um, or CASACs being eligible now under the Department of Health regulations. Um, they are, of course, also eligible under OASAF telepractice regulations. Um, and effective July 1st, OASAC will have a scope of practice guideline document for KSACs. Um, so essentially, whatever a KSAC can do in person, they can also do via telepractice. Um, limitations, if any, derive from the OASAC telepractice regulations. So what services can they deliver? 
Um, case acts are included in the amended public health law to permit them to be reimbursed by Medicaid for services that they deliver by a telepractice. Um, and of course, as a reminder, telepractice is of course limited to buprenorphine eligible practitioners, and those are um, physicians in mid-levels and KSACs. So currently social workers, RNs, and licensed mental health counselors um, cannot yet provide services by telepractice. So we are now going to open it up to Felicia Parker. Um, Felicia, you can share your screen. Uh, Felicia is from North Country Family Health in Watertown, New York, and I chose to highlight the work that um, her and her team are doing because it's, it's highly innovative. Perfect, I can see your screen. It, it's highly innovative for upstate New York and really the country. They are doing a lot of work with teledentistry and a newly developed school-based telemedicine program. And school-based telemedicine programs are certainly of um, premium interest lately in my world and teledentistry is so unique and I get a lot, asked a lot of questions about that. So who better than to speak to it than the person who is um, very much involved in it. So Felicia, um, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, all right. Well, thank you, Katie. Um, I, I appreciate um, you coming to me and, and asking um, for me to just speak about um, some of our tele telemedicine initiatives. Um, we're very excited about them and, um, you know, very happy to speak on that. Um, so, as Katie stated, uh, my name is Felicia Parker. I'm the Community Health Coordinator for North Country Family Health Center. Um, so, for those of you that don't know, we're located in Watertown, New York. So, we're, we're just a little over an hour north of Syracuse um, in, in what people would call the North Country or, or the, the winter tundra, um, for those of you that are familiar with us. Um, but I've been with the health center since 2016, um, and I primarily work with our patients who are homeless or facing housing crisis, and I do link them with community resources um, to help find affordable and stable housing. Um, and then I also, um, you know, do some work with our uh, telemedicine programs. Um, so that would be our teledental program, um, which I'll be speaking about today. Um, and I'll also be touching on our telepsychiatry program and um, two new initiatives that we are um, currently working on our school based telemedicine and teleretinopathy program. Um, so, first, I just wanted to give a little bit of background about uh, North Carolina. Felicia, are you still there? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep, now I can. Okay. Um, so um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, North Country Family Health Center um, and just give a little bit of background um, for those that aren't familiar uh, with, with us. Um, so the health center was founded as North Country Children's Clinic in 1971. Um, there were a group of local community service agencies that identified that children in Jefferson County uh, were not receiving their well child care um, from birth to about age five, so basically before they started school. Um, so these volunteers um, from the different organizations um, came together um, to pretty much um, create the North Country Children's Clinic. Um, and they recognized that there was a need for a model that would decrease barriers to care, such as lack of insurance and transportation. Um, and so since the founding in 1971, um, the health center has be become the primary private non-for-profit multi-service agency of its kind serving Jefferson County. Um, the principal is offering quality health care regardless of income and ability to pay. And that really just remains um, the agency's foundation to this day. Um, and then as we continue to, to grow um, and expand, we recognize the need to also meet the needs of um, the adult population. Um, and so in June of 2012, uh, we became a federally qualified health center so that we could expand services to adults as well. 
Um, and we really like to offer or look at ourselves as um, a one-stop shopping um, for healthcare services. So, you know, we're able to offer primary preventative health care, um, nutrition education, we have a WIC program, uh, dental and mental health services, insurance assistance, um, and care coordination. Um, and all of these services are located out of our main um, location in Watertown. Um, so, you know, these are, I, like I said, I just wanted to give people a little bit of an overview of the health center. And as you can see on, on the screen, um, you know, from start to beginning, we really kind of look at what the need is in, in our local service area. And as we do that, we look to expand and provide services to meet those needs. So I'd like to start with um, just talking about our telemedicine program um, and, uh, you know, and how that works and how we got um, and how we started, you know, looking into this. So around 2014-2015, um, we really began to notice an increase in the referrals for pediatric oral surgery. And this was really due to the increase in significant dental caries and decay that we were seeing in our pediatric patients. Um, and what we were finding were some obstacles in getting these patients seen in a timely manner. Um, and some of this was just due to a low ratio of pediatric dentists to patients in our service area. And other was due to, um, you know, of those few local pediatric dentists, um, some did not accept Medicaid or managed um, care insurance. Um, and so, you know, with those barriers, we really kind of look to see how could we, um, you know, break down the barriers for our uh, dental patients so that they could receive the needed treatment. Um, and again, um, when talking about some of those barriers, even for those patients that could be seen locally, some of the wait lists were quite long. Um, so sometimes we were looking at six to eight months before uh, patients can be, could be seen. So in recognizing the need for a referral source um, who could see our pediatric patients, um, you know, we began discussions with the University of Rochester's Eastman Institute for Oral Health. Um, we were aware of their teledental program and really saw this as a solution to um, breaking down those barriers for patients. Um, so in uh, 2016, um, we entered into a contract with the University of um, Rochester Medical Center um, to begin the program. Um, so we had some face-to-face -face meetings um, between uh, North Country Family Health and um, the Eastman Institute. Um, and then we were able to agree upon a contract so that we could commence the program. Um, part of that contract was Eastman provided the health center with a laptop and um, the intraoral camera, um, which is one of the uh, peripherals that are used as part of the teledentistry program. Um, and I will be able to show uh, what that looks like in, um, in another slide. Um, and um, we are able to have access to their network and use of the Cisco Jabber system in order to provide the live two-way feed needed to complete the consultation. And in addition, um, Eastman had um, some funding that they re had received through HRSA um, that allowed for the provision of a community health worker to help facilitate the program. Um, so that is, as um, the community health coordinator, uh, that is part of my role in our teledentistry program. Um, and so with that contract, patients um, would be referred uh, to Eastman for consultations and treatment. So a little bit about the workflow. Um, so a North Country Family Health Center dental provider will identify a patient who presents with significant dental decay. Um, and might have some limited resources to accessing services lo locally. So, for example, that would, you know, that could be one of our Medicaid patients. Um, the provider will make a in-house referral to the community health worker, so that would be myself. Um, and the parents must sign a consent for telehealth services as part of that referral. Um, I then reach out to the parents. 
um, to schedule the consultation with one of the residents from, from Eastman. Um, and um, I also communicate with the scheduling coordinator. Um, so she will send me a list of the dates and times that each of the residents are available for, for a consult with North Country Family Health. Um, and then I present those dates and times to the parents as I receive referrals from, from my providers. Um, and um, so after I scheduled the appointment with the parents uh, for the patient, um, the patient would come to North Country Family Health Center for the actual consultation. Um, myself and a dental assistant are, are present during that um, consultation, and the dental assistant acts as the telepresenter. So essentially, they are um, sort of the hands and the eyes for the uh, resident or the distant provider on uh, the Eastman end, um, so that they can do a complete uh, consultation and assessment of the patient and what they have going on, and they can so that they can make. Um, a recommendation for treatment. Um, and then after uh, recommendations are given, so typically it's usually a recommendation for um, treatment within the emergence or the OR. Um, so a lot of the patients that we see coming through our teledentistry program have significant dental decay. Um, so, um, you know, they might have multiple cavities. Um, some of them have, have come through and, and they might have abscesses um, and we've had a few that have come through that um, have to have extractions. Um, and so often uh, we see recommendations from the residents um, that the patient will need to go to the OR for treatment. Um, and then we have a few that are recommended for sedation and then um, there are some that are recommended for nitrous treatment. Um, so once we um, receive the recommendation and the, the, the distant provider has spoken with the parents about, um, about the recommendations and their questions, I work closely with the families to ensure that um, there's follow through for the treatment. So whether there's any transportation barriers, scheduling, um, helping them if they need to uh, secure or figure out child care. Um, whatever, you know, whatever it is so that there are no barriers to getting that patient to treatment, I'll work with the parents to do that. Um, and then once uh, treatment is completed, um, then um, it will, the patients will come back to North Country Family Health Center um, for, for any follow-up. Um, and, you know, and then they'll continue their, their normal course of preventive treatment here with us as far as cleanings and, and that sort of thing. Um, so as you can kind of see down here in the corner, there's a little bit of a picture of how it, how um, you know the tele, the teledentistry would work. So you have your your dental assistant here with the patient, and then the provider here um, on the distant end through the telemedicine equipment, um, and um, that's, that's essentially how um, um, how it would work. Um, typically, I will um, I will connect with uh, Eastman prior to the patient coming in, so the dental assistant will go out and grab the patient. I'll connect with um, Eastman just to make sure that there are no issues as far as the connection is concerned. Um, and so that way the, uh, the, the provider is already up on the screen when the patient walks into the room. Um, this next slide um, shows our actual uh, dental cart that we have here at North Country Family Health Center. Um, so this is, uh, we were provided with a Dell computer from Eastman, um, along with the camera that's attached to the top of the laptop, um, and that just provides really clear, um, uh, a clear view for the provider on their end. Um, the intraoral camera here just plugs in um, through the USB, um, and so once it's plugged in, it connects through the Cisco software. Um, and then when it's turned on, um, it will show a it will show a uh, a double screen. So we can see the provider um, on the east fin end. They can see us here um, on the patient end. And then in the double the second screen, when the intraoral camera is turned on, the provider is able to see the child uh, the inside of the child's mouth. So the dental assistant can show um, the teeth, the gums, the throat. 
um, anything that the provider uh, requests to see so that they can do a thorough uh, consultation and uh, assessment. And this is a mobile, uh, a mobile unit, so it can be moved to any of the exam rooms um, in our dental, uh, our dental department. Um, so, you know, if there's a, a case where, you know, it has to be moved to another room, um, it makes for a really easy transition to the other room. Um, and the, the laptop is, you know, connected to our, uh, our Wi-Fi system. Um, so it makes moving it even easier. Um, so these are just some numbers about um, about our teledental program. So since the implementation of the teledental program, we've seen uh, 31 children um, and two special needs adults. Uh, typically, Eastman, the Eastman Institute for Oral Health, um, their, uh, the, the pediatric dental department we work with primarily only sees children. However, they've been very flexible in working with some of our um, adults with special needs. Um, and they've been able to do consultations and, and make recommendations for the parents as far as, as far as what type of treatment might be useful. Um, so these were adults who um, had cerebral palsy um, and um, it had been difficult to provide um, treatment for them and so they were able to help us with that. Um, so to date, 12, 12 patients um, have completed their treatment or they're in the process of completing treatment. Eight are currently scheduled for treatment um, or awaiting treatment, and most of those are, that are awaiting treatment are, are OR cases. Um, right now, they have about a five to six month wait for OR treatment. Um, they see children in the OR five days a week, so they're they're pretty busy over there. Um, so, but they're they're able to get them in about five or uh, five or six months. Um, out of the, um, you know, we did have four who chose to go to a local provider. Um, two, unfortunately, I lost contact with due to, um, you know, phones being disconnected or no longer in service um, and, um, you know, not having contact with them. We've only had one situation when there was, that there was an insurance issue as far as the actual treatment was concerned, um, and one parent chose to go elsewhere for a second opinion. So as with any sort of program or any anything that's a little bit new, um, you know there were some barriers or obstacles that uh, that we've had to that we've had to work through. Um, the biggest being uh, billing and reimbursement. Um, and since implementation, figuring that piece out has really been an ongoing effort. Um, at the very beginning, a lot of the um, insurances were you know, denying claims for, um, uh, you know, for teledentistry. Um, and most were coming back stating that it was not a covered service um, for the patient. Um, you know, we were, we got a little creative and we were able to see some reimbursement for claims coded under um, what's called an office visit um, where no service is provided. However, that was, you know, kind of really paid under a fairly low rate. Um, but recently, uh, United Healthcare provided the health center with two new teledental codes that were released from the American Dental Association. Um, so I've put those on the screen here. So the first um, code is the, the Dental 995 Teledentistry Code, and that's for the synchronous real-time encounter. Um, so that's that live two-way feed where you have the provider, you know, the distant um, provider and then the patient on their site end. Um, and they're able to have that interaction. And then the second code, the 999, or the 9996 teledentistry is your like store and forward, um, where the um, information is stored and then sent to the dentist where they can review. Um, so, you know, uh, what, after receiving those, those new codes, we've been able to go back and resubmit um, four teledental claims and we're anticipating that we'll have um, some resolution on those soon. Um, and we've also been going back to other um, insurances to discuss with them, you know, if 
uh, they will be re reimbursing with these codes as well. So I really give a lot of, um, um, you know, our, our, our uh, billing and um, our, you know, they work a lot with our insurances to, um, to work through this and they put in a lot of work, tr you know, trying to figure this out. So I do give them a lot of credit for that because I know it's not easy. Um, and then the other um, sort of uh, barrier that plays, that comes into play a lot is distance. Um, it is about a two and a, two and a half hour drive from Watertown to Rochester, um, and um, in the winter it can be an even longer uh, a longer drive. Um, and so, for some of our families, um, you know that can be a hardship in a, of itself. Um, you know, if they lack transportation or, or do not have reliable transportation, um, that can be a huge barrier to getting them to get their children to. Um, uh, to get their treatment. Um, so we really work with them to break down those barriers and I've listed a couple of things, you know, we use Medicaid transportation and those types of things to help the, help the families. Um, so um, I'd like to move now into a uh, little bit about our telepsychiatry program. Um, this was actually uh, one of the first uh, programs that we really um, dived into. Um, we began a program back in July 2010 um, where we were connecting patients to a specialist at Upstate Medical Center for treatment and diagnose, diagnosis consultation. Um, from the beginning, um, we found that there were some limitations uh, with this model. Um, one, it was time consuming because the patient and provider needed to be available, um, or the patient and their primary care provider needed to be available um, to the distant uh, specialist, um, and that proved to be um, difficult at times. And then in addition, um, patients were not provided continued care um, as a part of the program. Um, so um, we, we, we tried that for a little bit and, you know, and realizing that it wasn't, um, um, that, it, that it wasn't conducive to what we were trying to provide, um, we unfortunately had to end that program. Um, but, you know, looking, you know, flash forward to October 2017, we relaunched a program. We were approached with um, an opportunity to partner with Comprehensive Medicine based out of Rochester um, for telepsychiatry services. Um, we were able to hire a psychiatrist as an independent contractor um, and we connect using the Cisco Jabber system. Um, and um, because the psychiatrist is an employee of the health center, um, she is able to have access to the electronic uh, health record. So she's able to work very closely with our providers here um, and providing the best, you know, behavioral health care that we can for our patients. Um, and then we're, you know, this allows us to then bill the patient's insurance for, um, for the services. Um, and uh, the, the ratio of psychiatrists to patients here in the North Country is fairly low. Um, and the wait list um, can be incredibly long. People um, are sometimes waiting six plus months before they're able to get in with a psychiatrist. Um, so really being able to offer this to our patients um, has, has really been very helpful um, as we can, you know, uh, we can keep the services all under one roof um, and really provide the best um, best care possible. So now on to some of our you know upcoming telemedicine initiatives. Um, our school-based telemedicine program, um, we're really excited about you know getting this up and running. Um, we are looking to pilot this out of one of uh, our local school districts here in the North Country. Um, we currently operate a school-based health clinic in South, the South Jefferson School District. Um, the two clinics are located in the district's two elementary schools, so students have access to medical, dental, and behavioral health services. Um, the school district, in partnership with North Country Family Health, really recognized the need to expand access for its middle and high school students. Middle and high school students. So, if a student who's enrolled in our school-based uh, program 
um, from the high school or middle school was in need of medical care, they had to be transported to one of our um, sites at the elementary schools. Um, so we were looking, you know, how can we uh, expand that access for them and cut down the barriers um, because often the parents were the ones that were being asked to come and pick their child up to take them to our other school-based sites. Um, and so we really, you know, in looking into it, um, felt that uh, having a telemedicine program would really be the solution to that. Um, so the idea is that a student would pre present at the school nurse office, um, you know, for any sort of acute illness, and then they would be able to be seen via the telemedicine by a uh, North Country Family Health practitioner through one of our school-based health center sites. Um, and the goal being that, you know, we're increasing access for students, we're increasing school attendance. Um, so, you know, maybe instead of them being sent home, um, you know, for a cough, you know, if they're able to see the practitioner who can determine that, you know, it's something that they can remain in school, then we're keeping them in school and they're not missing classes. Um, and then again, just breaking down any barriers um, to, to seeking care. Um, and so I have a, this is what the telemedicine cart looks like for our school-based program. Um, so it's a little bit more, um, a little bit more to it than our teledental, teledental cart. Um, but we have the all-in-one HP monitor. Um, and that just sits on a mobile cart that can be sort of rolled around the room um, if need be. Um, there's a keyboard that sits on top of the cart along with a speakerphone and a mouse. Um, and then a little bit of storage underneath um, for any of the equipment that's needed for um, uh, to do the telemedicine. Um, so, and then this next slide just shows the different equipment that's used. Um, so this is the digital ENT otoscope here. Um, so it's essentially the same that any provider might use, you know, within uh, the practice. Um, so if they need to get a good look at um, a patient's eye or in their ears, the only difference is that there's a USB cord that plugs in here into the actual um, all-in-one um, so that when it's plugged in, it, inter um, it interfaces with the Agnes software that we use to um, provide or to do the telemedicine. Um, this is a general exam camera. So this can be used, um, you know, if a child has, maybe they come in with, you know, with a rash or something like that on their arm and, and they uh, it needs to be looked at. The same thing, um, a USB cord plugs into the back of the camera, the, then the cord is then plugged into the um, HP all-in-one screen and again it interfaces with the software so that then the provider on the distant end can interact with the, um, the school nurse who's the telepresenter um, in order to, to see the child. And then lastly, we use a telephonic stethoscope with a headphone. Um, so this allows um, the provider on the distant end to be able to hear a heartbeat or, um, or the lungs. Um, so the, the nurse or the telepresenter would have this all hooked up into the um, all-in-one unit. Um, and when it's hooked up, um, again, interfaces with the Agnes software and the provider uh, on the other end is able to um, hear a heartbeat or hear the lungs um, and um, provide any necessary, um, you know, assessments or treatment. Um, and then lastly, um, I just want to touch a little bit about uh, teleretinopathy, which is another uh, new initiative uh, that we are uh, participating in. Um, so through funding that we were able to receive, um, we were able to purchase a Welch Allen Retina View camera to, um, to complete diabetic retinopathy screening. Um, and so initially the thought was we would complete the screens and send the images to a provider through Welch Allen to, to be read and then they would send um, any recommendations back. Um, but then an opportunity was provided through Fort Drum Regional Health uh, Planning Organization through their initiative um, with Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield 
to be able to work with a local provider. So they've been really um, helpful as far as uh, connecting us with local providers um, uh, to to provide or to do the reads for the images that are sent um, through using the uh, Retina View camera. So essentially, we are all connected through uh, the Welch Allen network, um, so that um, the exams can be done at the primary care provider office with the patient, and then the images can then be sent um, into the network so that the a specialist can open and then um, examine the images and uh, give recommendations. Um, it's really to focus on, you know, those diabetic adults to assure that they are getting the screenings as needed um, so that, you know, we're catching any abnormalities become, before they become even larger issues. Um, and this is fairly, fairly new. Um, you know, we're just getting into contracts and um, you know, finalizing things with the specialist so that we can start doing, um, you know, doing the screenings fairly soon. Um, so here's just a picture of the actual camera um, that we'll be using. Um, as you can see, um, you know, the provider or, or the nurse um, will hold the camera up, so this end of the camera to the patient's eye and be able to take images. Um, and when those images are taken, they are um, uploaded or sent into the um, Welch Allen network, which is um, secure and HIPAA compliant, so that then the specialist on, on the other end can uh, pull the images up, um, look at them, um, give an assessment, and then make any rec recommendations for the patient um, based on what they see in the, in the image. So that's a little bit about our uh, telemedicine projects. Um, I think um, as I conclude this presentation, um, a lot of uh, questions that come up are, you know, in, in deciding on to do telemedicine, what comes first? So I thought, I thought this image of, you know, chicken or the egg um, kind of made sense because, you know, what comes first? Do we, do we uh, figure out the billing piece of it? Do we figure out the programming portion of it? Or is it, or is it the opposite? Um, I think for North Country Family Health, um, in each instance that we have um, began a telemedicine program, we really looked at what the need was and how we could best serve our patients. And we found that the need really outweighed having to sort of wait for that billing piece to be in place. Um, and given the rural um, makeup of our, of our service area, um, you know, distance and, and uh, low ratio of specialists in our area, we really felt that telemedicine is the solution to providing the best care that we can for the patient. Um, and we recognize that, um, you know, even with um, policy coming into play as far as, um, you know, uh, telemedicine is concerned, often the um, advancing technology moves a little bit more qu quickly than those policies. But again, we really feel that you know telemedicine uh, uh, offers the solution to breaking down barriers for care um, for our patients, um, and so we're really excited to move forward with these um, programs and um, and um, offer offer these services to our patients. So I just want to say thank you for allowing me to present on on um, on our on our initiatives. And if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Yes, Felicia, I do have a question for you. Um, curious. I, now I know you're just doing like low acuity issues in the schools to start. Um, and that there are different privacy regulations for general telehealth and telemedicine versus telepsychiatry. But when you were or are setting up your program in the schools, have you had any difficulties with um, the school's firewall? Uh, yes, that was a big um, that was a big issue when we first um, started testing in the schools, um, and we really. Um, we're really grateful that the school district that we're working with um, is also a big um, supporter of telemedicine in the school. So they've been really helpful as far as um, working on the administrative end um, to help us get through those firewall barriers. And we've worked really closely with between our, our 
our IT people on our end and the school's IT people um, to make sure that um, we're able to provide any services without any sort of um, hiccups or, or interruptions during um, during any uh, appointments. Okay, thank you for sharing that. I, I'm working with several um, local schools on some different initiatives, and that has certainly been a challenge that we have encountered. Um, schools have to seem to have a bit um, heavier of a firewall than maybe other organizations. Yeah. So it's reassuring to hear that we're not alone in that regard. Yes. Yeah. And then another question that came up, and I actually really like this question and would be interested myself. Would you or your billing team be willing to discuss the different reimbursement challenges you've encountered? Um, that may be a follow-up. Maybe I'll put that in the meeting notes and you and I can talk offline about that or if you have any quick high-level points right now. Um, yeah, I'd be more than happy if you I could provide you with a little bit more information on that. Um, I can I can say quickly that um, it it all it hasn't always been the easiest. Um, you know, we've really had to um, you know push for uh, push for claims and resubmit claims um, multiple times. Um, telepsychiatry seems to be um, more easily reimbursed um, than some of the other initiatives. Um, we haven't yet um, done any claims for the teleretinopathy because that is, um, you know, that's fairly new. And as far as um, within the school setting, um, right now, because we are in FQHC, um, we are not able to bill as a distance site. Uh, but I know that that is a conversation um, kind of like what Megan mentioned earlier um, that is being worked on with the state to hopefully um, make some amendments to that to that regulation. But yeah, I'd be more than happy to provide you with um, some more detail. Okay, yeah, we can we can I'll have you summarize that offline and I'll share that with the group um, in the meeting notes. And I just wanted to thank you again for speaking. Um, you've reiterated a, a point that I think I, I try to um, state on an almost daily basis with a lot of the partners I work with in that, you know, the reimbursement landscape will eventually catch up, but I think it's so important for organizations to look at making that upfront investment. And it's not a massive upfront investment. Um, making that now so that they are a bit ahead of the curve and the reimbursement will eventually catch up. It's about creating that access and convenience for your patients that I think outweighs any of the other um, issues or challenges that you may face with it. And there are more and more organizations that are starting to realize that. Um, and, you know, and to be completely honest, I think in the North Country compared to the rest of the United States, um, I, I think, you know, telemedicine is outpacing what's happening in some of our North Country areas. Um, obviously, you are keeping up with the paces, but, you know, the, some of the major health systems are now seeing more patients via virtual visits than they are in person. So, um, virtual care is certainly here to stay, and I'm glad to hear that you guys are doing so well with it and expanding the services that you offer. So, thank you. You're welcome. All right, um, so just to wrap up, I have a couple of updates for the group. So I just want to remind everyone that the um, North Country Telehealth Conference is coming up. I'm just going to show my screen quickly. If I can figure out how to do that. All right, it's not letting me share my screen. Give me one second. All right, well, that's fine. Um, I sent out the save the date for the North Country Telehealth Conference um, earlier last week or the week before. Um, and that is going to be on November 7th and 8th. This year we're adding a pre-conference session from 1 to 4 p.m. on Wednesday the 7th. The conference is being held at the Queensbury Hotel in Glens Falls, New York. Um, so a bit more of a central location than Lake Placid last year. And the pre-conference is um, 
a, a co-event a co that we are putting on alongside the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center. Um, they have agreed to um, be a, a co-sponsor and a co-presenter on that. So Andrew Solomon, who's a project manager with the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center, is going to be um, presenting the pre-conference alongside myself, and we're looking at getting another speaker for the latter half of that. And then the actual conference is all day. Um, we're looking at probably the 8 to 4 time frame on Thursday the 8th. And the focus this year is going to be virtual care in a value-based world. Our keynote speaker has already been chosen. It's Dr. Raul Vasquez. He is the president and CEO of the Greater Buffalo ACO. And he also um, owns and operates several uh, independently owned primary care practices in the Buffalo area. I'm still looking for attend um, attendees. I'm still looking for uh, presenters. So if you are interested in presenting a breakout session in the afternoon, um, please reach out to me. My email is kcook, K-C-O-O-K, -O -O -K, at ahihealth.org. Um, also, if you are interested in sponsorship or vendor opportunities, please reach out to me as well. Um, and then lastly, the one last piece I wanted to update everyone on was that there is an excellent resource in the Center for Connected Health Policy. Um, I'm not sure how many folks on the line are aware of the Center for Connected Health Policy, but I am going to just share my screen really quick. Um, hopefully everyone can see this. The Center for Connected Health Policy comes out with an annual, um, they may even do it twice a year, um, telehealth policy for all 50 states. It's several hundred pages, but you can very easily navigate to New York State. And if you look um, on this website, it's cchpca.org. You can highlight any individual state you want to look at. Um, for example, obviously New York, and you can look at all types of legislation as it relates to reimbursement, regulatory environment, definitions, what is the broadband landscape, pilot projects. There is so much information on this website, um, and I'm hopeful that all of you on the line are at least aware of this resource or are using it. So um, please uh, reach out to me if you want the direct link, but otherwise it's cchpca.org. It's a fantastic resource. Um, Bob, do you have any updates from the Fort Drum side? Uh, just a quick update on the uh, on the uh, video teleconferencing proposal that we put out with our uh, teleconferencing group uh, about two months ago. We do have a contract in place with SUNY Upstate Medical. Uh, we have begun testing the new Jabber video client, uh, version 12 of that client. Uh, we have a, another test to run between that client and the uh, one of the hardware appliances, an SX20. And then once we're done with that, uh, we'll be finished with the testing and starting to roll that out to software client only to users. And then later on in the, uh, in the course of the next month, we'll start talking about uh, adding hardware appliances to it as well. Excellent, thanks for that update. Um, I don't have any other updates on my list. Um, just uh, stay tuned for the meeting notes afterwards. And um, coming in the next month or two, a link to register for the telehealth conference in November. Um, again, feel free to reach out to, with, to me with any questions you have about that conference. Um, that wraps up our session. The next one will be on the third Monday in July. And that, I believe, is, I'm just double checking right now, that's July 16th at 2 p.m. Um, this should already be on your calendar if you are registered for this, so you shouldn't have to worry about that. Um, we are still looking for a speaker for the July Learning Collaborative, so if you are interested, please reach out to me. Um, other than that, I will wrap it up for today, and I hope all of you have a great week and enjoy the beautiful weather today. Thank you.